I've learned a lot over the years of being a technology enthusiast and working in IT. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into choosing a motherboard for your NAS at home. Come along if you're ready to get learned, but bring a beverage because this is going to be quite the adventure. What do you want, is what I would exclaim if you dare have the audacity to talk to me in person. No need for the anxiety though. There's a screen between us. In order to choose a motherboard for your use case, your use case needs to be defined. If you have watched some of my other videos, I generally follow the design process for any project, and in a way, choosing a motherboard is part of designing your NAS. In this process, I create a list of requirements, objectives, and interfaces desired in a solution. So we need to know, what do you require from your NAS? I think everyone can add securely stored data to their list, but are you going to be video editing? Maybe video streaming through an app like Plex? Are you going to host an application like a Minecraft server? Are you going to have multiple people accessing the data simultaneously? All of those requirements can drastically change the hardware required to support them, and subsequently the motherboard that connects them all. What would be nice to have on your server? Maybe it's not worth it if the price increase isn't worth it. You're going to want to securely store data, but do you think it may be possible that you will want to stream from Plex or host a Minecraft server a couple times for fun? Maybe you require that you need 6 terabytes of storage, but it would be nice if 1 terabyte of that is highly available. Available meaning high bandwidth and low latency. You need to be able to build an on-paper system before choosing a motherboard. For the interfaces, it's really just going to be network related in this case. You can make sure that you have the choice to plug in a monitor directly into the motherboard for debugging and the install process, but that is pretty much standard on all motherboards these days and really just comes down to the CPU choice. You can decide that you want to be able to connect to your router network wirelessly, but I would highly discourage that. You really want the rock solid reliability of a cable when it comes to a data transfer, especially when large files could be involved. If you have decided that you need or really want 10 gig for your workflow, that could be here as well. That being said, I've created a few different distinct configurations that I will present in a later chapter of this video. Let's start thinking about the resources that are involved in a motherboard to support network attached storage. It is virtually impossible to recommend a static option for motherboards due to how fast the market changes, so some basic knowledge is going to be required to make a choice. A big thing that motherboard manufacturers like to focus on is the absolute awesomeness of their 69 plus 42 phase power delivery system for the CPU. <laughs> motherboard power delivery is usually overkill and intended to accommodate overclocking. You will likely not have to concern yourself over this unless you are running the absolute highest end CPUs. If you want to learn more about CPU and RAM power delivery, you can watch the video from LTT on motherboards, or I'm sure you can find a Marianas trench of a deep dive from Gamers Nexus, my favorite source of computer information. Another big thing in the 1000 character internet listing titles on the motherboard is the chipset. This is actually important to consider when choosing a motherboard. A chipset can dictate a large portion of how many devices can be simultaneously connected on a motherboard, including SATA ports. Intel and AMD both have their own naming scheme, kind of. They both use the same naming convention, but maybe one number lower or one different letter. Charts are available on AMD's website that detail the capabilities of each of the chipsets. I'm not going to go over each chipset in detail, but I want to go over B550 and X570 in this chart since they are still readily available to buy new. We want to look at the PCIe generation, as the chipset will be connected by four PCIe lanes to the CPU. X570 shows the PCIe generation as 4.0, however, B550 shows that PCIe 4.0 is only available from the graphics in NVMe. That means that the connection to the chipset is PCIe 3.0, half the bandwidth of the X570 chipset. Looking at the AM5 chart, we can see that there is what appears to be a decrease in bandwidth capability when looking at the maximum number of SATA ports. But this is because AMD moved towards increased support for NVMe drives and high-speed USB. Now we can see the PCIe 5.0 coming in, which doubles the amount of bandwidth per lane from the previous gen chipsets. Although, it is important to notice that all the chipsets will only be connected to the CPU via 4 PCIe 4.0 lanes. Unfortunately, Intel's website doesn't have a great chart to compare the chipset options side by side, but Wikipedia has come to the rescue. First off, Intel calls their chipset connection DMI lanes, which are effectively the same as PCIe lanes. However, the naming is a little misleading. 
HDMI 4.0 X4 is the same amount of theoretical bandwidth as PCIe 3.0 X4, and DMI 4.0 X8 is the same as PCIe 4.0 X4. I would speculate that Intel went with DMI 4.0 X8 instead of updating to DMI 5.0 X4 is due to the same reason AMD took the computing market by storm in the recent years. They just fell behind in developing and updating new architectures and processes. Now that we know that the chipset is connected to the CPU via PCI Express lanes, let's get familiar with it. The latest PCIe generation that you will see, as of writing this video, is 5.0. Each generation doubles the bandwidth throughput of the previous generation. PCIe 5.0 provides up to 4 gigabytes per second per lane. 4.0 is 2 gigabytes per second, 3.0 is 1, and so on. The available bandwidth is going to dictate how many devices, and how fast those devices are, that you will be able to connect to your motherboard. Most of the time, motherboard chipsets will have 4 PCIe lanes connected to the CPU. So for PCIe 5.0, that's 4 times 4, 16 gigabytes per second of total bandwidth. The amount of bandwidth available to the chipset would decrease in the same way as the bandwidth of a single lane of PCIe generations decreases. PCIe is most commonly addressed in listings as the PCIe slots on the motherboard. These slots are where the largest amount of data can be accessed by the CPU. PCIe slots range from 4 lane size slots to 16 lane size slots. However, most of the slot sizes do not reflect the amount of PCIe lanes actually wired to the slot. This is done to maximize physical compatibility with add-in cards. Most motherboards have one 16 lane slot nearest the CPU that is capable of utilizing the 16 lanes. Much of the time, there are two 16 lane size slots, but both slots cannot be run at the full 16 lane bandwidth, and will likely run at 8 lanes of bandwidth each. This is not something like a cost saving measure, it is because every CPU has a limited number of PCIe lanes that can be connected simultaneously. Although, AMD Epic's line of server CPUs can have seemingly limitless amounts of PCIe connectivity with 128 lanes available, but if you're watching this video, you're likely not building a server like that. In order to find out how the CPU PCIe lanes are split up, a person will have to look at the motherboard manufacturer's manual. Lastly, the motherboard I.O. on the sides of the board will also be connected via PCIe lanes to the CPU. However, they can include devices that will switch the connections based on when ports are actually being used. In summary, the CPU only has so many PCIe lanes with so much bandwidth. Therefore, we need to find a motherboard that is capable of utilizing the lanes as we need for our NAS. Unfortunately, this isn't an obvious option since even motherboards of the same chipset can be configured differently from each other. You really just have to know what amount and where you need bandwidth on the motherboard then dive into the user manuals and spec sheets on the manufacturer's website. So, your CPU can only handle so much bandwidth. How does that bandwidth relate to the devices I will be connecting to the motherboard? Let's go over these common devices. Most hard disk drives have a maximum data transfer rate of 220 megabytes per second. This is, equates to 1.76 gigabits per second. This is good to know because SATA 3 ports are normally advertised with the 6 gigabits per second data rate so you could theoretically provide enough bandwidth for three hard drives through one SATA port. SATA solid state drives will typically max out at 560 megabytes per second, which is the 4.5 gigabits per second. Still less than 6 gigabits per second, but that number is theoretical, so you will likely never actually achieve the full 6 gigabit through a SATA port. So it is safe to say that a single SATA SSD is enough to fully saturate a SATA port. Now these things are important to realize when trying to add more SATA ports to your motherboard through a PCIe expansion card. If your motherboard doesn't have enough SATA ports, you can get a PCIe SATA HBA card that installs in a PCIe expansion slot. You need to be very careful to pay attention to the PCIe generation and lane width when purchasing one of these cards. Amazon has plenty of options that have something like 10 SATA ports, but is only connected to the motherboard via 2 or 4 PCIe 2.0 lanes. PCIe 2.0 is only 500 megabytes per second per lane, or 4 gigabit per second. So a card that has a 4 lane connection would only have a max throughput of a 1000 megabytes per second. That is enough for about 4 hard disk drives, and almost enough for 2 SSDs that are being fully utilized. Although, 
There are many times that you will get far less than the maximum read or write speed of the hard drives, like when moving a bunch of small files. This may be okay with you if you're going primarily for higher capacity storage and don't need the fastest speed that you can get. How important that will be to you will also heavily depend upon the network interface card that you will have and the network that you're connecting to. Most motherboards will come with up to 2.5 gigabit networking these days, but it may cost absurdly more in order to get a motherboard with 10 gigabit networking built in. The network is going to be by far the biggest bottleneck for your NAS. Remember, even a single hard disk drive can theoretically fully saturate 1.76 gigabit on its own. If you want a 10 gig NIC, you can get an Intel X540 T2 for $65 that will use 8 PCIe lanes since it's an older card that uses PCIe 2.0. If you are restricted on your PCIe lanes, you can opt for the Intel X550 that only uses 4 lanes because it can use PCIe 3.0, but it costs $175. If you are a pro and have an infrastructure for 25 gigabit, you can get a fiber optic NIC that uses 8 lanes for PCIe 3.0. Important reminder, the network that you're plugging your NAS into needs to be able to support the speeds of the NIC you choose. It would be quite the waste if you put a 10 gig NIC in your NAS when the switches and or routers in your network can only support 1 gig. Even worse, getting a 25 gig SFP NIC only to find out that your whole network infrastructure doesn't even have an SFP port to speak of. Most home networks are going to be limited to the RJ45 port. You can adapt SFP to RJ45 if you like burning money, but I would recommend making sure you know your whole network setup and maybe even plan to upgrade it with your NAS. One last thought until we move on to the examples. TrueNAS, the operating system that most people should probably use, has fantastic compression for storing data on disk. I have had large 250 gigabytes folders on my YouTube videos that TrueNAS was able to compress to around 95 gigabytes when I wasn't using the data. That means I can save a lot of money by not having to buy as many or as as high capacity hard drives. Now let's move into some examples. I came up with a few example scenarios, casual, enthusiast, and prosumer. The casual configuration would be someone who just needs storage for all of their household photos or just doesn't need a lot of bandwidth all of the time. So this will include needing up to four hard disk drives and use the included onboard networking of one gig, two and a half gig being an unnecessary bonus. The enthusiast configuration would be someone that has the capability to do most kinds of fun projects with their NAS. Things like video editing, streaming, steam caching, Minecraft server, etc. This NAS would have something like 6 hard disk drives or 4 SATA SSDs with an NVMe SSD cache drive and 10 gig networking. The prosumer setup is thought to be for someone who needs large amounts of data at high rate all the time. The person that had this configuration would be on the edge of wanting a proper professional setup like you see in many large TechTuber channels, but doesn't have the funds for that order of magnitude budget increase. The configuration has 8 hard drives or 6 SATA SSDs, 3 NVMe SSDs, and 25 gig networking. Starting with the casual setup, you don't really need much of a motherboard for this scenario. You just need a motherboard with at least 4 SATA ports. If you are on the fence about going Intel or AMD, it's really difficult to recommend Intel at this point due to the high power consumption of the platforms. Disclaimer, I do own a small amount of Intel stock, so I'm technically invested in the company. Power consumption is especially important since this will be a device that will likely be powered on for long periods of time. You're going to want something that is reasonably power efficient so that you can minimize the extra cost of power. A B550 motherboard can be found new on Amazon for about $100. As of the writing of this video, the MSI B550 Gaming Gen 3 would be a good option paired with the Ryzen 5500 for $86, or if you don't have a GPU to temporarily install during the TrueNAS install process, the Ryzen 4600G for $91. An enthusiast class motherboard is definitely going to need to step up in order to meet that demand. It will be worth buying a higher end motherboard that can accommodate the extra SATA drives because otherwise you will need to buy an HBA card as well. You will need at least 6 SATA ports, 2 M.2 slots, and an X8 expansion slot. The ASRock X670E Pro RS for $220 seems like the best deal. You get 6 SATA ports for hard drives or SSDs. You can put an NVMe cache drive in the top M.2 PCIe 5.0 slot and you can put an NVMe boot drive in one of the PCIe 4.0 M.2 slots. It comes with 2.5 gig networking port, 
but if you want 10 gig, you can use the X16 expansion slot to throw in an Intel X540 for just around $65. Throw in a 7600X and you won't need to connect the GPU for the setup process. If you plan on going for a Minecraft server or some other service where you need to dedicate more cores, then I would go to a 7700X. For this one, I could only find one motherboard that fits this use case perfectly. It's just $461. The ASRock X670E Tai Chi has 8 SATA ports for your hard drives, plenty of NVMe, and even two X16 PCIe slots that support bifurcation so that you can run them both at X8. The ASUS ProArt X670E and MSI Meg Z790 Ace are both options, but you would have to buy an additional HBA card if you want to install more than 6 SATA hard drives, which makes the ASRock a far better value. With this board, you can plug in 8 hard drives via the SATA ports, cache that pool with the M.2 5.0 slot just below the CPU, RAID 1 the M.2 4.0 slots to have a redundant boot source, and use the M.2 5.0 slot next to the RAM for some high-speed storage when needed. If you're feeling real crazy, you could RAID 0 the NVMe 5.0 SSDs as a cache for the hard drive pool instead, which may actually make the most sense. Finally, because 10 gig networking is too slow for you, Throw in a 25 gig networking card in the top X16 expansion slot, or maybe even two Intel X540 T2s and link aggregate at four 10 gig ports into a virtual 40 gig port. That's it. I really hope this video was helpful. It definitely took me a long time to write. Don't be afraid to let me know in the comments if you learned something here. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Maybe share this video with someone who may need to learn a thing or two about choosing a NAS motherboard. This isn't my day job, so I just post videos whenever I can. Thanks for sticking around.